A reading from the epistle of Blessed Paul, the Apostles of the Corinthians. Brethren, if I should speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I were a prophet and knew all mysteries and had all knowledge, and if I should have faith so great that I could have moved mountains, but not have love, I am nothing. And if I were to give away everything I have fed to feed the poor, and if I were to hand over my body to be burned, but not have love, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It does not put on airs. It is not snobbish. Love does nothing rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not prone to anger. It does not brood over injuries. Love is not happy over iniquity, but rejoices along with the truth. Love covers over everything, believes everything, hopes for everything, puts up with everything. Love never fails. Prophecies will pass away, tongues will be silent, and knowledge will pass away. We have only incomplete knowledge, and our prophesying is incomplete. When that which is complete comes, then the incomplete will pass away. When I was a child, I used to talk like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish ways. We see now in a mirror, in a confused short of way, then we shall see face to face. Now I have only partial knowledge. Then I shall know even as I am known. Here and now there are three gifts that endure. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Please stand for the gospel. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy, Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, twelve, taking aside the twelve, Jesus said to them, Now we are going up to Jerusalem, and all that was written by the prophets will be accomplished for the Son of Man. He will be delivered up to the pagans. He will be mocked, outraged, spat upon. They will scourge him and put him to death. On the third day, he will rise again. But they understood nothing of this. This word remained in the dark for them, and they did not understand what he said. As he drew near Jericho, a blind man sat at the side of the road, begging. Hearing a crowd go by, he asked, What is that? They replied that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Then he shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Those of the lead sternly ordered him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus halted and ordered him to be brought to him. When he drew near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he answered, That I may see. Jesus said to him, Receive back your sight. Your faith has saved you. At that very instant, he got back his sight, and he followed him, glorifying God. And all the people witnessed it and gave praise to God. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This first reading today from Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, is probably one of the most famous readings. His Greek is absolutely beautiful in this letter here. It's probably one of the most beautiful texts, in all of, in, at least in the New Testament. If you ever go to a wedding, you'll hear this. 
90% of the weddings that I, every Catholic wedding, this is always the, the reading at Mass, or one of the readings. Paul is speaking about, of course, love. If I have no love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I were to give everything away and I fed the poor and if I were to hand over my body but not have love, I would gain nothing. And then the famous line, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, does not put on airs and not snobbish. As Paul continues, he's meditating upon this beautiful agape, the self-sacrificial love, which we shall see beautifully culminate in what now our Lord will speak about here in the gospel. Gather with the twelve, it says, and the twelve, they don't, they don't understand the words of our Lord. He says, I am going up to Jerusalem where I will be delivered up to the pagans. They would have been absolutely shocked at that notion. Given up to the pagans, what are you talking about, Jesus? Aren't you the Messiah? Aren't you going to destroy the pagans? Level them? And we're going to rebuild this magnificent kingdom again? They don't understand. He says, I will be mocked, outraged, and spat upon. They will scourge me, and they will put me to death. Again, imagine being one of the twelve hearing this. And they do not understand. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to be raised up on that cross. In John chapter 3, verse 14, he will tell his disciples that just as Moses was lifted up in the desert, Moses lifted up that bronze serpent in that desert. Just as Moses lifted up that serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And again, another strange line. Jesus would make a parallel between the raising of himself on the cross to that pivotal event in Numbers chapter 21. And so the two are linked, our Lord says. So go back to Numbers 21. The Jewish people are journeying to the desert. They sin. They complain to God. And then, out of punishment, God would send serpents to the Jewish people. And they would be bitten by the serpents, and then many of them would die. Do you remember that pivotal event there? And then the people cry out in repentance, Moses, help. And then then God tells Moses, Moses, make a bronze serpent, lift it up, and that all those who gaze upon it, so, so Moses holds up the serpent in the desert, and the people, if they want to be healed, must look upon it. What does or did the serpent represent for the Jewish people in the desert with Moses? For them, the serpent was the cause of their shame and their fear. It was a reminder of their disobedience and death, sin, you name it. So that serpent represented everything that they were terrified of. And then strangely, Moses says, is called to hold it up, and the people are called to look upon the source of their suffering. It is that pivotal event in Numbers 21, Jesus would refer back to. Why? You know, in my own ministry as a priest now, praise God, I've been a priest now for over a decade, one of the hardest parts of our job is is that confessional. I've shared about that, how in that room I love it and I hate it at the same time. Why? Because you guys unload beautifully. And then, and then 
and then I'm supposed to sputter something profound, at least I hope I, I try to. But the most profound words are the words of absolution, the words of our Lord that he gave us to forgive your sins. But if you notice this about our own hearts, if you ask yourself, why do I sin? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why, why do we sin? Again, all of us here, let's remove the mask. All of us sin all the time. We have all our own addictions. We have our own patterns of behavior. Every single one of us. That's like, again, no shame here. Catherine of Siena, writing in the, in the dialogues, she, she critically wrote that in order for us to grow in holiness, we must dwell and, in the heart of self-knowledge. She speaks of it as a mirror of self-knowledge. Meaning, whenever we sin, Catherine of Siena will tell us, ask yourself, why? What is the deeper cause of our sin? Delve deeper. Because there's always a tendency within every single one of us is to run away from our sin, to hide, or to labor it. Oh, we are good. You, you talk to any counselor or, or, or psychotherapist, part of their hard work is to remove the layers and to get down to the deep core of our wounds. And Catherine of Siena brilliantly said, we have to get down to those areas. Why, am I, why do I keep doing what I'm doing? Remember St. Paul, he would, he, would, he would reflect upon that in Galatians. Why do I keep do, doing the sins that I know that are bad for me, and yet I still choose it? He's speaking about this pattern of sin. Why? How, in other words, can we be healed from this? It is only in love. Hear that again. Our healing can only happen in this profound love that St. Paul is speaking about here in Corinthians. Jesus upon that cross, which is the greatest act of love that humanity will ever see. Upon that cross, just like the serpent in the desert in, in, the, book of, uh, in the book of Numbers in chapter 21, when we gaze upon Jesus on that cross, I want us, if you, want, if you want to go in holiness, look upon Jesus and see all of your shame and your pain and your fear right here. All of the filth, your darkness, all of those areas which we've learned over the decades to hide, thrust it upon Jesus on that cross. Put everything there. Because what sin ultimately is, sin is, is a hiding of our shame and our pain. We cover it up. This is why the patterns of sin keep, keep going. It's because it's a sign that that, that wound that we have in our, in our hearts and our souls is still in need of God's grace to, be, to, to finally be purified. So every time we gaze upon that cross, thrust upon all of that shame, that darkness that terrifies us right there, just like Moses did with the bronze serpent in the desert. Because it is only when we gaze upon our pain there on that cross we will finally be healed from it. There is no other way this is why I love why we always speak of why Paul is speaking, speaking about this love. If you notice this way about love, and I'll end here on this final note. In love, there's freedom. This is why lovers sing, by the way. We sing because we're free. And oh, how many times I've seen people walk out of that room when they've encountered the love of Christ's forgiveness out of there. Always I hear, Father, especially if somebody has been away from, from the church for, in, for a long time, I always hear this. Father, and they're smiling. I feel lighter. <laughs> their hearts, they say they want to sing. Because only in love are we set free. That's why we must gain, uh, gaze upon that cross. Put everything there. 
we hide nothing.